Hey everyone, this is the fifth lecture of week five. And again, you could listen to this as an audio if you want, and you want to read Genesis uh, chapter 30 verses one through 25 before you listen to this lecture. When we left off, Jacob has found himself married to two sister wives. This is kind of where that comes from, okay. One of, uh, one of whom he loves, uh, but is infertile, Rachel, and another uh, you know, wife who he doesn't love, but who is very uh, fertile, okay. Um, and as uh, we talked about last week, for whatever reason, God, um, because uh, Re Leah is unloved, makes her more fertile while letting Rachel, the beloved wife, remain infertile. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as we noted earlier, the you know one of the main ways that women were judged in the patriarchal ancient Near Eastern context of the Bible was centered on their ability to have sons. Children, yes, sons are more important, okay. Uh, the portrayal of Rachel, therefore, the beloved wife struggling with infertility, and in contrast, Leah, the unloved wife, who is very fertile, um, it fits this kind of literary pattern that you see throughout the biblical text, okay. Repeatedly, the biblical text portrays the beloved wives, um, such as Sarah, Rebecca, um, later in 1 Samuel, Hannah, uh, also Samson's mom, um, as infertile. Okay, and, and again, this may be in part to stress the specialness of the child. Yet, uh, despite the, you know, I mean, this certainly raises the drama of the narrative uh, with this trope. Uh, you know, the constant and uneasy, the constant and sort of odd uh, focus on the female body in the text, written and edited by groups of elite male scribes. You know, this is, it's a little icky, right? A little disturbing. And this is especially the case if we imagine ourselves in the place of these women who are forced in the text uh, to struggle and compete with each other to obtain the thing that they lack, okay? which is then oddly possessed by the other. So for Leah, uh, this is the love and regard of her husband. She does not have that. And for Rachel, of course, um, it is male heirs. Okay, which will allow her some security and also help to maintain her position in the family. So one woman has love, but no children. The other has children, but no love. Okay. Um, also notice the kind of disturbing ways that the male characters are depicted as exacerbating and even creating the fissures between the women, between these women. So the unequal regard of his wives by Jacob, okay, um, which is countered by the woman's unequal ability to have children by God. So, it, it's, you know, so Jacob does one thing, God does something in retaliation. Both of these things heightens, uh, Jake, uh, heightens Leah and Rachel's context. Okay. As evident, the machinations of the male characters in the story, Laban, who did this in the first place, Jacob, and even God, who is, uh, as I stated before, envisioned as a male figure throughout you know, most of the entirety of the biblical text, honestly, um, thus lead to a desperate and rather heart-wrenching birthing battle between the two female characters as both women try to have as many sons as possible. And we see this um, in chapter 30, Genesis chapter 30, verses 1 and the following. <clears throat> when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister, and she said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. And Jacob became very angry with Rachel and said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of your womb? Jacob, not the most sensitive fellow here, okay. Uh, then she said, here is my maid Bilhah, go into her that she may bear upon my knees and that I too may have children through her. So she gave him her maid Bilhah as a wife and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son then Rachel said, God has, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she named him Dan. Rachel's maid, Bilhah, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she named him Naphtali. When Leah saw that she has ceased bearing children, she took her maid, Zilpah, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, good fortune, so she named him Gad. Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob another son, and Leah said, happy am I, for the woman will call me happy, so she named him Asher. 
the <clears throat> actions of these women evince the helplessness and distress the they feel. Okay? Rachel, who remains childless, becomes so desperate that she gives her maidservant to her husband as her proxy. Okay? Leah, after her childbearing days are over, does the same by giving Jacob her maidservant <laughs> almost in return. Right? And, and we know from this earlier story about Hagar and Sarah that giving your slave woman or servant woman as a substitute, as your substitute to your husband, well, this was you know, no easy task. Right? It was an emotionally and politically fraught thing to do, right? Because it had the potential to lead to a readjustment of statuses in the family. Um, it was in short, an act of desperation. Okay. So uh, notice how the um, desperation comes through, right? Notice also that Rachel and Leah's voices and feelings, right? Um, which are largely missing in the text, right? Why? Because these are female characters. Notice how they are conveyed not through, not only through their actions, but also by the names they give to these children in Genesis 30, okay? Um, many of these names, like all names in the biblical text, are false etymologies. They're kind of, you know, there's a kind of made up story for why the uh, children are called that, right? Why somebody is called that. Okay. Uh, and, the, and the real meanings of the names are, are probably lost. Okay. However, um, despite them being false etymologies, um, the names, however, provide an interesting um, window into these women's feelings, right? what they're going through in their struggle. Right? And, and if you look at the names very closely, these children's names allude to, unsurprisingly, the competition between the sisters, this is in verse 7, the hope that the woman's husband will now respect them and honor them, this is verse 20, um, and even the, even the hope that God will vindicate a reward of, of a person, right? This is in verses 6 and also in verses 23. The names, in short, allude to the harrowing situation that the women have been forced into by their father, their husband, God, and generally this patriarchal society of which they are members, a society in which two women who are sisters have to compete for the regard of an important male figure, their husband, by reproducing as many male children as possible. Now, <clears throat> these stories, uh, pretty, pretty dark, uh, might have a larger purpose than just merely exposing the detrimental, detrimental effects of patriarchal societies. Um, as with the story of Hagar and Sarah and their competition, this story of the birthing contest between Leah and Rachel um, might also be used to explain more current uh, political rivalries in Israel with which the biblical writers might have been more familiar. Um, so um, remember I said uh, earlier that Hagar and Sarah's narrative foreshadowed and maybe justified or tried to explain the exodus. Okay? Um, so also Leah and Rachel's rivalrous relationship might foreshadow and explain the rivalry um, among the 12 different tribes that make up Israel. So unlike <clears throat> with Abraham and Isaac, by the time you get to Jacob and his children, the question is no longer which son will become a lot. Right? Rather, all the sons of Jacob will become elect, right? Um, and all the sons, each of the sons of Jacob will become the forefathers of different Israelite tribes. Okay? Um, just because they are all elect, however, does not mean that there are no rivalries, right? That's not how this works, right? Indeed, um, you will get uh, two, uh, you, get, you will get lots of different rivalries, right? And two particular ones, um, particular rivalries amongst the 12 tribes of Israel, um, <clears throat> might be reflected here in the story of Leah and Rachel's birthing contest. Okay? The first rivalry that may be alluded to is this rivalry between northern and southern Israel. Okay? Um, as I will probably explain in a future video, I hope, um, the 12 tribes of Israel um, during the time of the United Monarchy will be ruled by one king, David, and then also by Solomon, his successor. Okay, and this period when um, it, when Israel, when all twelve tribes of Israel are ruled by one Davidite king, um, Davidic king, someone from the line of David, this will end with the end of Solomon's rule. After Solomon's death, okay, um, the twelve tribes of Israel will split into two countries. Okay, um, <clears throat> and the two countries will be first you have North Israel, okay, also called Samaria, and sometimes in the biblical text, confusingly just called Israel. Okay, whatever. Uh, so North Israel will consist of 10 tribes, and it will be generally led by the tribe of Ephraim, although it would be a pretty unstable nation in some ways, okay? Um, and, and Ephraim is one of the tribes associated with Joseph, 
Okay, and Joseph, as you will find out, is a son of Rachel. Okay, um, so <clears throat> North Israel. Okay, in contrast to North Israel, um, there will be South Israel, also simply called Judah. And, and the South Israel or Judah will consist of two tribes. Okay, and unlike the North, they will continue to be ruled by a king from the line of David. Okay, and the head tribe of the South or Judah will be Judah, right? Um, and Judah, as you will come to find out, is the fourth son of Leah, okay? So in short, um, the Leah and Rachel rivalry seems to reflect and maybe explain the rivalry between North Israel, whose main tribe is the son of Rachel, and South Israel or Judah, um, whose main tribe is a descendant of Leah. So perhaps this is what's reflected in um, this narrative, okay? Um, <clears throat> This story might reflect another slightly, slightly different rivalry, okay, um, that, that concerns kingship, okay. The first king of Israel, King Saul, um, as you'll find out, comes from the tribe of Benjamin, okay, and Benjamin is the second son that Rachel will have, okay. However, um, Saul is overthrown by a usurper, the famous David, okay, and David comes from the tribe of Judah, right, who is the son of Leah. So it might be possible that there's another rivalry that is reflected in this kind of Rachel and Leah's birthing competition. And this is the rivalry between David and Saul, okay, or between a descendant of Rachel and a descendant of Leah for kingship, okay. So this might also be a possible kind of reference, okay, behind the story. Um, as evident, the rivalry between these sisters not only speak to future rivalries, right, uh, but also will ultimately lead to um, the many sons that are needed to constitute the various tribes of Israel, okay. And, and therefore, you know, the competition does play a part, right, in, you know, fulfilling this promise made by God to Abraham that he will be the father of many descendants, right? And as we know, coming up, um, Israel consists of 12 tribes, 12, again, being a kind of number of perfection, right, of completion, right? And this is a very positive reading of the birthing contest. You know, of course, there's a more negative reading, right? The competition among these siblings, um, as we've seen before, right, will have pretty tragic consequences, right? Um, as I will maybe allude to later, Rachel will die in distress and pain while giving birth to her second son, Benjamin, en route back to Canaan. So this birthing contest will lead ultimately to Rachel's demise, right? And, 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 and this, of course, affects Leah as well, right? Um, Leah, after the death of her sister, is never heard from again, almost as if she died when her sister did, okay? Um, Indeed, the competition between the sisters is even more tragic when we realize that outside of the birthing contest, Rachel and Leah re really are described as a kind of cohesive unit. You know, at times they speak as one voice, okay? Um, compelled to compete with each other by their father, husband, God. Rachel and Leah, therefore, seems to elucidate the harmful effects of patriarchy on women, children, and the family unit the way in which it fractures families and sets one family member against the other. Um, indeed, the fracturing of the family caused by rivalry and, and competition will continue to the very end of Genesis. Okay. However, before this can happen, we have to have Rachel finally being granted her wish to have uh, sons of her own. So for that, turn to the next video.